and Alar's daughter of Shurdal. So let's start at the end. I always drop my stories near the end. So you all probably familiar with this place, Fresh Creek Lutheran Church in Wisconsin, yeah. because buried yeah. there is our great grandparents, Holy Larson and Anna Samuel's daughter. Now we got to disambiguate this wife's name a little bit because there was Anna, wife of Isaac Larson, our grandmother. Of course, she spelled it with an A, but it's the same name. And then there's Isaac's mother, Anna Samuel's daughter from Norway. And then there's Anna Lars' daughter, Oli's mother. She's buried just a few steps away from Oli there with Oli's sister and her family, the Brush Creek. And she's the one I'm talking about. She was born in 1801, not 1798. I was able to find out that uh, it's definitely the right person because Oli and all of his sisters were raised by their parents, Lars Paulson and Anna Lars' daughter. In case you don't know where Frome Parish in Gubrasdal, Norway is, well, we've got Google to fly us there in one minute flat. So right in the center of <laughs> South Central Norway, wow. in between the major cities of Oslo and Trondheim, you have the region of Gudbrandsdal, a landlocked valley. Uh, it's very isolated by mountain passes. In fact, it's so isolated that people there speak their own distinct dialect. Even a person, a native of Oslo, sometimes has trouble understanding someone from this region because there's very little in or out migration, especially in the old days. Even now, their dialect is very uh, distinctive. And people didn't travel, let alone migrate, in or out all that much. But in the middle of Goodbrunsdal, we have the parish of Fron, F-R-O-N. You zoom in on that, you'll see these, these are modern communities that you're looking at there. There weren't any towns or cities back then, but the Sorfron Church, that was there back in the day. We'll get back to that a little later. George, Scott yes. had a question. Yeah. Yes, well, I was just thinking of keeping the, the language, uh, the dialect, is that a point of pride? Do you think for them now? It used uh, to I be think for some, to, some travel, but. to some extent, and it's probably not quite as pronounced as it used to be, but I've heard uh, cousin Anna, Myrna's daughter, say that when she traveled up there, she had a really different, she has no problem understanding her friends there, but uh, she had a lot of problem understanding the people in that region. Oh, interesting. In the middle of Frone Parish, you have a farm complex, several farms actually, called Shurdal. It's a large, uh, several farms, but down in South Shurdal, there's a little plot called David Haugen. And I was able to find this thanks to uh, my friend and mentor who took me right there when I visited Norway 10 years ago. Of course, it didn't look like this at all. It didn't have any of the modern buildings and roads uh, through it, probably just one lonely uh, Husman's house. What's a Husman, you might ask? What's a Husman? Yeah, what's a Husman? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. A Husman was essentially a peasant. They didn't own any land. Uh, he worked uh, full time for the landlord. In fact, his family members would work too when it was busy, uh, just to rent a small plot of marginal land where he could build his own house. Uh, of course, he had to build it with little or no money, and it was pretty small and modest. Uh, this is a museum exhibit uh, representing a Husman's home, and you can notice the small size and very primitive structure. In addition to his rent, the Husman may receive a small ration of flour when it's harvest time or other produce of the farm but uh, cash wages in the pennies, if any at all. The key to the agreement was the right to build this house where he could raise his family. In fact, the custom would not allow you to get married unless you had a house, of course, to raise your family in. <coughs> Here's another exhibit from, from a museum of an interior scene inside of Usman's home. Notice the compact structure. We're looking in the door, but we're seeing uh, most of the house right here uh, on the right, you've got the fully equipped kitchen with a porridge pot and an open hearth. 
also providing the heat for the, the entire home. And on the left, your sleeping area. You have the bunk on the top for mom and pop and probably a toddler in between and the uh, cradle for the baby. And down below the uh, main bed, you have a little pull out for at least two children. So you can see here sleeping and cooking and heating facilities for a family of five or six people. This is the typical Usman's living arrangement. So let's go back to David Haugen. Uh, Paul actually took me there. We couldn't go on the property because the owner was not uh, friendly to Genia tourists, but from the road, I was able to photograph this little home, or it's not a home now. It's a little building, quite old, the oldest and smallest building on the compound, I'd say. It just put me in mind of uh, our grand, great, great grandparents and the size and the sturdiness of a home that they probably raised their family in right here on this very plot of land. Oli was the seventh of seven children, the first six all born here at the little farm. The oldest was a boy, Paul, then followed by five girls, all between the years of 1821 and 1837. All of them baptized, as you can see their records on the left there at the South Crone Church. Note the similar names of the youngest two children, Marie and Marit. Um, that's, uh, those are the two who came to America with Ole and his mother. Why they named them in such a similar way, I don't know. There are no more records for the second daughter, Anna. That's why her name is faded to gray here because she must have died as a child. I just wasn't able to find the record. Uh, the rest I, all, I found confirmation records and marriage records. Not for Paul because he died on June of 1836. Now this is pretty significant for the family. I mean, small children die. Well, kids die at all ages, of course in those days, but just becoming old enough to work and help support the family, and he's gone, and now you have only the four girls. It must have been quite a blow, especially because 19, 1836 happened to be the beginning of a major slow motion disaster. We're talking about the famine of 1836 to 1840. This is a real event documented in uh, this book by Einar Holtagen. That title translates Out Wandering to America from Ringaboo. And so it happens that Ringaboo is the next parish right next to Frome. Several factors leading to this famine. Uh, one was overpopulation due to a lot of good years leading up to this. Also medical advances, including significantly, I'd say, a smallpox vaccine. Even in this primitive stage of vaccines, the, uh, it was mandatory in Norway by this time. You couldn't be married or even confirmed, I think, without being vaccinated. Then there was the crop failures, a long drought, plant and animal diseases, potato blight, a lot of stress. Government tried to help. They uh, sent wagon loads of grain up from Oslo, but it took two weeks for every wagon to get there. That's after the grain was shipped in by sailing ship. So the logistics were just overwhelming. People were grinding up birch bark and moss to cut their flour so they could bake a loaf of bread. Now, unlike Ireland and a few years later, people did not die by the thousands of sheer starvation. Hope Hagen even states that uh, no one starved to death. I think that probably is a bit of an exaggeration when you consider the opportunistic diseases, malnutrition, it must have been plaguing them. So after four years of this, so happens that Anne and two companions stole a small amount of food from a nearby farm. Actually, there were three total thefts on two farms. This is one of the documents in the case. And by this document, Anne is sentenced to eight months in prison. Mind you, this is petty theft. These three people stole a total of two bags of flour, four pieces of meat, one measure of potato, probably a medium-sized bucket, three cabbages, 
about a pound or so of cured herring, a little bit of fabric and some warm clothes. Pretty harsh in the sentencing department. Now, Anne appealed her sentence twice. In fact, it went to the high court, but uh, after 11 months, she's taken away to serve her sentence in the prison. George, I have a question. Yes. Um, Go ahead. I, I'm remembering from when you've told this story before that yeah. there's not a record of uh, the other two women that were caught with her. They, they were younger than Anna, uh, and uh, one of them hadn't been confirmed yet, and they got lesser sentences. Anna okay. got eight months, the other two got like six and four months or something, something okay. along that nature. And I think that may be the reason that Anna appealed her sentences, but uh, to no avail. So because she was older, they kind of looked at her as the ringleader? I, I think they kind of considered her the ringleader, which was probably not right, but anyway, that's what, that's what they did. And George, how old was she at the time then? She was 40. Okay. She was 40 years old. Uh, now that we got this going again, I can show you how far she had to go. By now, she's already farther. She's never been in her life outside of the parish, outside of Goodbrestal, to, to the capital city. 150 miles is at least eight days by some of the faster modes of transportation, like a horse and buggy. Eight days travel into the capital city. Of course, this is the modern city that we're looking at here. But these, these are the blocks where the prison was located. George, now, George you, would there have been a train line that ran up that no train, way? Or? No, in fact, even if they immigrated, even when they immigrated in 1865, there was still no train to Goodbrestow. Wow. Traveling I, to the prison, uh, would the would the Court have provided that transportation? Would she been transported like a criminal in, in handcuffs? I mean, do you have any idea? I don't really. I can only imagine that yeah, uh, most likely, yes, the government had to provide some kind of transportation. Even if she had to walk it, she'd they'd have to have be, be walking with an armed guard or something. Most likely she was in a buggy or a wagon or a sleigh if it was, but it was June, so probably a, a wagon or a buggy overland. <laughs> Any idea who she was stealing for? Kids still well, living? Well, after a four-year famine and the, given the items she stole, I can only assume that she was desperate that her family was on the brink of starvation. The same with her young companions. I don't know, but I don't think that there they were uh, system of fences around or any way that they could actually sell the stolen goods. And even if they could, there was nothing they could do with the money. Right. Even people who had money had a difficult time getting food and necessities because of the shipping and logistics problems. And, and so, her kids were still really young. Uh, Oli was the youngest, but the sisters older than him couldn't have been like two, four, six years old. No, the, the youngest was, what did I say, 1837. The youngest was like two or three years old. Yeah. So who cared for them? Well, their father probably, or the, or the parish church. Uh, but she's she she's pregnant on this one. That's right. She? That's right. She is pregnant. She she probably knew it at the time. Almost three months pregnant. But here's a picture of Oslo Prison. This would be just about how it looked. The main building at the time. It was built in 1740 and not demolished until 1938. There are many other buildings there on two large city blocks. For part of its life, the prison was women only. But most of the time, including while Anna was there, it was co-ed. You can just imagine, though, that coming to a place like this from where she came from, with her dialect, it must have seemed like she was in a foreign country. Because oh. she must have found it very hard to relate to the other prisoners, to the guards, to anyone, really. Here's another picture outside the fence in the early 1900s, some of the other buildings. This, this uh, stone wall ran all the way around those several city blocks. And when they tore it down in 1938, <clears throat> they didn't leave very much. They left a few little fragments of this stone wall, some of which are in, uh, retained in the modern city architecture. Here's the document from when Anne entered the prison uh, by the high court sentence of the 23rd April. This is dated the 19th of June, 1841. I don't know if this is the door she went in, but again, just conjuring up pictures in my mind. 
what the document doesn't mention, she was approximately 12 weeks pregnant. Here's a view of the exercise yard again, much as it must have looked like in the 1840s. You've got to think about this time period, 1841, about the time that Oliver Twist was published in England. If you think of Charles Dickens's description of prison life, yeah, wow. and, then I can, and then compare that with the factual descriptions that I was managed to find of Oslo prison, um, they're just as horrifying or more than anything that Dickens wrote. George, were some of the other prisoners, uh, they had some done some pretty bad things. She was she thrown in with murderers. I'm sure there were everything from murderers to uh, other petty thieves. The majority of them would have been city people. But but yes, uh, I think all manner of female prisoners would probably have been housed together in the same uh, overcrowded dormitory, pregnant or not. There was, uh, of course, diseases. Uh, the only time that the overcrowding was not critical was when a disease would run through and kill a quarter to a third of the inmates and it wasn't quite so crowded. There was hard and usually meaningless and tedious labor done by both the male and female inmates. And the beatings, oh the beatings. I read about this. Every Saturday, the prisoner would be chosen, taken out in the yard in front of everybody and beaten. Could be any infraction, large or small, Sometimes just a new arrival would get a beating just as a greeting. Wow. Uh, one year when they happened to keep records of the 52 beatings, 22 men, 30 women. So women were not exempt. Oh, goodness. Now, wow. I hesitate to mention this. There was no mention in any of the documents of sexual assault, but uh, hard not to uh, conjure up images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, Anna married, managed to carry the pregnancy to term, perhaps Thanks to goodness. <laughs> the preterm. I'm glad about that. Yeah, but lucky for us that she did. Huh? Yeah. Boyd was born 10th of December, 1841. This is a picture of the prison chapel, again, out of period. I don't know what it looked like back then, but um, he was baptized by the prison's priest. And here's the record. And here, here it is, the son of Lars' father's name, Lars Paulson of Skurdal. That's the suffix meaning a peasant's farm under Skurdal. And the prisoner had a Lars daughter. Mm. <clears throat> they were released on the 19th of February. What does that make, Ole? About two months old. Still in winter. And here's the record of that. It states that she is to be transported back to prone by sleigh. Again, eight days or more. So eight, imagine eight days in a taxi cab, probably the closest thing you could think of. Of course, it doesn't have any windows. It doesn't have a heater. And it's February and it's Norway. And you're traveling on a prisoner's passport, meaning anybody who looks at your document is going to see that you're a felon. So you're bound to get the worst possible accommodations every night. But back to David Haugen, she went. And the next major event was the death of Lars Paulson in 1855, 10 years later. No breadwinner in the family now, always 13 at this time. And with two of his sisters, the youngest two of his older sisters are still at home. Don't know how they got along after that. He was buried, Lars was buried on the 6th of March. There's his record. Here's Ole's confirmation, 7th of June, 1857. So it was, is Lars buried at the Sorfron Church? I'm, su I'm sure that he is. There's no marker and you wouldn't expect there to be a marker. Even if someone of more means would probably, their marker would be gone after this long. Yeah. He, he may have never had a marker or had only the crudest, most temporary kind. Now we come to 1865, another eight years. And we have this immigration record. Emigration, I should say. And they're leaving. Out, out flying from the parish. And here's their destination, North America. Maybe you can read that. 
and here's Ole, Ole Larson, and here's the single women, Marit and Marie, Lars' daughter. The one who's not on here is Anna, but we know she came, she's buried here, plus she's on the passenger list. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe she was like excommunicated, so the church just didn't mention her anymore. I really don't know. How in the heck did they figure out how to get enough money to be able to do that? Yeah. I think it had to be really tough. I'm almost sure that they must have had some uh, friend or relative who was already there in Wisconsin and who sent them the money. 1865 was just the beginning of the real flood of immigration. Even though it was 40 years after the very first boatload, they just started, they were just were starting to come over by the hundreds and thousands. In a few more years, the, the government will be actually be giving people money to get here, to, to, immig to emigrate. Norway would pay them to leave, but this wasn't happening yet. But they had to get to, first they had to get to Oslo to get on the ship. The first leg of the journey would have taken them to Lillehammer and pretty sure they would have walked there. I don't know how else they could have done, no railroad. But from there, they probably got on in a steamboat or trains on into Oslo. From there, they got on the brig at Atalanta. That's, that's what supposedly is a drawing of the actual ship. It was small. There weren't steamships going across the ocean yet. This was a small, even for a sailing ship, about 200 passengers in the compartment below deck called steerage. Extremely crowded, at least like this drawing here. They had to bring their own food, prepare it mm -hmm. on the ship. And that's all they had to eat. 50 days at sea. Oh. So they landed in Quebec, Canada. Here's the ship's passenger list. And here you can see Ole. Here's Ole Larson and Anna, his mother, 65 years old, with Marit and Marie. And above them, I circled these names, Engelbert Johnson and Hans Hansen, because those are the two men who eventually married Marit and Marie. Whether they knew each other before the trip or met on the trip, I don't know. But just to think to spend 50 days in that home. Oh. Amazing. Wow. But and we can make the trip in half a minute. Here we are to Quebec bringing, City. <laughs> yeah. Of bringing then, down so, much food for 50 days for five, four people. Yeah. I can't imagine. What, um, what, how did they do that? I know, it is amazing, isn't it? I mean, I suppose they had flour. And they probably had a little bacon, cured meat and stuff. But yeah. uh, it's just really pretty amazing to think of the hardship that, that, mm. they, that they went through. Anyway, here they are in Wisconsin and we're, we're home free. They built, oh. only built this house and got married in a few years. Mm. Only had 13 children before he died in 1908. Thirteen children with two two wives, right? Two wives. Mm -hmm. uh, ten ten lived to adulthood. Nine of them had their own families. And here we are back at the end of the story, Rush Creek Church. Oh, that was fantastic, George. So, yeah, yeah, that was, was George. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yay! So, Yay. 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 George, Uncle Olaf, now yes. that I knew, was yes. this his dad? Wait, it had uh, different Uncle moms. Olaf that... the, Uncle Olaf was the son of Ole and his second wife. Okay, okay. Uh, he okay. was the one that I remembered. He used to eat at our house about the time you were born. He lived at the Oregon Way Hotel. And I remember him too. Hills. I remember and, him too. I don't remember him swearing, which you mentioned. He swore like swearing. a. He's more like a <laughs> He was grandpa's half brother then, right? Correct. Yeah. Same right. father, different mother. Correct, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. No. Was he a longshoreman? Yes. Uh, I don't think so. I think he worked in the mills briefly, but I he think was the mill. retired. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, he just swore like one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I, I met one of his daughters who was just a little older than I was. Did he have more children than that one daughter? Do you know, George? Yes, he had two daughters, Clarice and yes. Aline, correct. Yeah. Aline is the old, his older Aline, daughter. Aline was the oldest. They're both still living. Where do they live, George? Aline lives right there in, in Wisconsin. I think she's in, a, she's in a facility in La Crosse now where her granddaughter lives. And Clarice lives in Florida. Oh. With her husband, they, they both have families. Erna and I went back to Wisconsin for one of the reunions at, uh -huh. that uh, Aline had when she had the Larsons. And her mother was a Sletton, so it was the yes. Larson Sletton reunion. Mm -hmm. So we got to meet some of our distant cousins back there. And mm -hmm. it was really a great trip. Really glad. Yeah, and Mom Larry and I went back one, too. That's right. Larry and I went back, too, once for the Larson Sletton reunion. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you guys like that. I could do another one on Lars Paulson and another one on Lars's grandmother, the murderess, if you'd like. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I would love that. All, all Great. of them. All of them. Great.